Okay, so you are what you drink. You have probably heard that before, right? Uh, you are what you think, you are what you eat. Uh, these are uh, statements that have been said by many uh, health practitioners. So here's the question for you today. Do you think what you drink affects the health of each and every cell in your body? That's the question that I'm going to ask Dr. Mercola tomorrow. Asking that question. But I'm also asking you. And uh, I think most people would answer absolutely. Uh, what we drink has an effect on our bodies. In one of the books that, that I wrote called uh, The PH Miracle for Weight Loss, we talk about the importance of drinking water, and one of the chapters is specifically on water. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And the reason why there's water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink is because it's contaminated. It's contaminated not with what I just got through talking about, ionizing radiation, but it's now contaminated with chemicals. And a lot of these chemicals are things that we're flushing down the toilet. It's getting into our water table. And so if you're flushing down Zoloft or Prozac or, you know, some high blood pressure medication, uh, statin drugs, what have you, this is now showing up in our water supply. So you could be drinking water and be on an anti antidepressant or, you know, an antibiotic or even, you know, some sort of statin drug and you wouldn't even know it just from the water you're drinking. So the key to a long, healthy, vibrant life is to maintain the integrity of the internal fluids of the body by a process of superhydrating or hydrating, I believe, with alkaline fluids. I recommend that a non-active child or adult drink at least one liter of alkaline water at a pH at a minimum of 9.5 uh, for each 30 pounds of total body weight. With increased activity though through exercise or sport I would set, or suggest increasing that hydration anywhere from one and a half to two liters per 30 pounds of weight. If we look at our collective health in the US nearly one out of two Americans has a chronic condition. One out of three U.S. adults has or will have high blood pressure, up 30% over the past decade. New type 2 diabetes cases have doubled in 30 years. Currently, more than 64% of U.S. adults are either overweight or obese, a 36% increase from 1980. The prevalence of asthma has increased 75%. 60 to 70 million annual cases of digestive diseases in the United States and nearly 46 million people in the US have some form of arthritis or chronic joint symptomology. So what does our health care cost us? It's becoming a huge part of our, of our uh, major budget, both uh, personal as well as governmental. 78% of healthcare dollars are spent on people with chronic illnesses. Per person, healthcare spending is projected to double. So what does lack of health cost each of us? So as you think about that question, and we tie that then into the importance of drinking alkaline water and maintaining what I believe is at the foundation uh, it's alkaline design. The most important fluid of the body is the blood and it's slightly alkaline at a 7.365. More and more practitioners and researchers now believe that chronic degenerative disease flourishes in an acidic environment. Our body will naturally buffer these acidic states. But its ability to balance pH has been overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with acidic waters that we're drinking, acidic foods that we're eating, acidic air that we're breathing. All of these contribute to an overall acidic body. So where do most acids come from? Acids are biological waste products of metabolism, of the breakdown of our foods and the liquids we drink when we exercise. We've all felt the biological acid of 
lactic acid and the effects and what it causes when the blood purifies itself by pushing that acid out into the connective tissue. We feel it as a pain. Acids from thinking. Now if you're thinking about this, you're already producing acid because our thoughts require energy. And as you're using that energy, that's a function of metabolism. So energy use produces waste products. Also, as acids affect each individual cells or cells that make up our tissues and our organs, cells can break down. And as cells break down, they also release acids. Uh, acids are also produced by, as cells break down, are produced by the bacteria that are created and the yeast that is created. Uh, produce acids like exotoxins and mycotoxins and of course we we have acids from our environment and uh, these acids are uh, carbon monoxide that we can see uh, in large cities uh, we see carbon monoxide coming out of the car as it's burning gasoline it's a biological waste product uh, and then acids that are unseen acids such as ionization, uh, ionizing frequencies that come from our cell phones or ionizing radiation uh, that's coming from unfortunately uh, nuclear plants that are melting down and are polluting our air and also our water. So what is the major organ or gland responsible for bu buffering acids of the body? I don't know if that question has ever been asked and you surely won't find this in any medical text. Would it be your lung, would it lungs or your liver, uh, your stomach or intestines or skin? I would like to suggest to you that the major organ of the human body that's responsible for neutralizing acid is your stomach. Now most medical science perceives that the stomach is an acid environment and that is correct after it produces the alkaline compounds that help to neutralize the acids from our food. And so the stomach is, uh, is a gland, or uh, excuse me, an organ that produces an alkaline compound called sodium bicarbonate. It takes sodium, it takes carbon dioxide, and it takes water to produce that, and it pulls it from the blood. If our tissues need alkalinity, it's the stomach that starts creating that sodium bicarbonate to pull into the blood and tissues. What you end up with is a belly full of hydrochloric acid, and this is what causes uh, ad nauseum. Uh, nausea, which is not described in any medical text as it pertains to it, it, its pathological or, origins, is simply the body's need for more alkalinity. And what a better way to increase alkalinity than with the fluids that you're, drink, that you're drinking, especially pure ionized or alkalized water. So the stomach is the correct answer. Can our body still handle this, uh, this, uh, this imbalance? We have turned an evolutionary corner. We simply do not handle acidic wastes the way we used to. This is Dr. Linda Frasetto, who I've worked with uh, on occasion with several clients uh, as it pertains to overacidity. And uh, her research has shown that the sheer volume of acid waste our body has to handle has forced us to take drastic war-style action to preserve it's strategic buffering reserves. And what are those buffering reserves? The sodium bicarbonate, the alkalinity that the body uses as the first defense on any acid. Of course, these reserves in the kidney and the liver are major essential detoxifying organs. The process of, or, or, uh, of overacidification is really reflected in a, in a foundational theory that there's only one sickness and one disease. Now, I know we have different names for illness and disease, but their origins are all the same. I've suggested in my work, in my research, that there's only one sickness and one disease, and that's the overacidification of the blood and then tissues due to a, a, an acidic lifestyle or dietary, or dietary choice. When we begin to live an acidic life, the first symptom of overacidity where the body does not have the ability to neutralize that acid or our channels of elimination have been blocked which are urination, perspiration, defecation and respiration if acids are not eliminated the body uh, tries the best it can and it uses its energy reserves to remove these acids and we start losing energy and we become enervated 
We seem to be tired all the time. The second stage of acidosis is sensitivities or irritation. Uh, allergies is a perfect example of this. Allergy is a sensitivity to some acidic toxin, either environmental or it could be food-based too as well. Uh, the body tries to, to deal with it. It tries to buffer it and then it tries to eliminate it. If the body doesn't have ample alkaline reserves to neutralize the environmental acid or the, um, or the digestive acid, it of course expresses itself as an irritation. The third stage of acidosis is catarrh. Catarrh is when the body uses its alkaline reserves to buffer the acid regardless of where it's from and it forms a sticky mass uh, of mucus. Mucus is then the body's way of neutralizing a very toxic substance so it doesn't permeate other healthy cells and damage them. Inflammation is fourth stage acidosis as we become more toxic, as acids build up, the blood tries to maintain its integrity and delicate pH is 7.365. It pushes acids then out into the connective tissue, which is the acid catcher, catcher, catcher for the blood in order to preserve the integrity of the blood. As acid is coming from the blood into the tissues, it causes a symptom. That symptom is inflammation. The fifth stage is induration. This is when the body uses alkaline buffers, uh, such as sodium bicarbonate, but others that the body could use, which would be sodium and magnesium, potassium and calcium. The body may pull calcium from the bones in order to buffer acidity, forming acid crystals. It takes then the acid from a liquid state to a solid state, thus preserving the damage uh, since these acids can permeate any cellular membrane and damage them. So induration is the crystallization of acids that build up on the walls of our arteries or builds, build up in our lungs or in our elimination organs that restrict uh, the natural process of eliminating waste products. If our blood cannot flow because of acidic crystal buildup, this can cause an increase in our blood pressure. So the symptomologies of induration would be things like arterial sclerotic plaque, uh, hyper, uh, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol, and even uh, hypertension, uh, where the blood pressure or the systolic rate uh, and the diastolic rate goes up. Even your pulse rate will go up. Uh, the sixth stage is ulceration. This is when our buffers have, have been depleted and the acids begin to deteriorate the tissues, causing internal, even internal bleeding. The seventh stage then is the final stage of acidosis and really the expression, the culmination of all sickness and disease and that is degeneration. When tissue begins to degenerate, it becomes very, very difficult to repair that. Degenerative tissue, if not eliminated, the body will encapsulate that using a clotting uh, mechanism forming a clot and we end up with uh, clots in our body. Uh, some clots or uh, some acid is bound by fat. It's a major cause of obesity is the body retaining fat as a protective mechanism in order to, buff, uh, in order to buffer acids that are not, are not being properly eliminated through the four channels of elimination. So the expression of disease, uh, may I suggest, is the body trying to preserve itself. We might even say the disease is an illusion. The disease in of itself is not the condition that we need to address, but, but the symptom of what is being expressed from an overacidic lifestyle and diet. So the body does some wonderful things to help protect ourselves from our own uh, acidic lifestyle and dietary choices. It will retain water. Now why would the body retain water? The body would retain water in order to protect the tissues protect the organs that sustain life. So the body retains water to neutralize excess uh, toxins or body acids. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the body retains fat as a buffer of excess organs, of, of excess acidity in order to protect the internal organs of the body that sustain life. The body will create cholesterol, uh, will use fats uh, and release those fats to bind acid too as well. 
to crystallize them so they don't permeate the cell wall and damage the cell. Also, if acids are damaging uh, the tissue from within to prevent from internal bleeding, uh, there'll be premature clotting to prevent acid damage uh, of the uh, uh, tissues and also uh, to uh, arrest internal bleeding. The body will also leach minerals such as calcium and magnesium from the bones or the muscles to neutralize acidity which can lead to stones but the stone is not the problem it's the symptom of acid that's being produced from an over acid lifestyle and diet. Tumors are also uh, problematic but once again the a very high level of expression of damage to the tissues where the body's trying to protect itself uh, so that uh, uh, one acid cell doesn't affect another healthy cell and cause it to break down. It's what I call the, the apple, rotten apple effect, where you would take a rotten apple and put it in a bushel of apples and, and of course the acids from that one apple would permeate the other apples, spoiling the whole bushel of apples. Well, the body protects itself from that happening where one cell is fermenting or breaking down. Its waste products or acids will spoil another cell. And of course, to protect that uh, domino effect from continuing or to protect the healthy tissue, the body will encapsulate, form a clot or a tumor to, to encapsulate those fermenting or acidic cells. The body will also remove acids out through the skin if they're not properly being removed through urination, defecation, or respiration. Uh, when this happens, strong acids can burn the skin, causing all sorts of blemishes and imperfections to the skin. The body does this all in an effort to maintain its delicate pH balance of the internal fluids at 7.365. So how important is drinking alkaline water. Dr. Atkins said this, and I quote, the cells and fluids in most people's bodies are overly acidic. This can cause a lot of health problems. It prevents your body from neutralizing and disposing of harmful, poisonous toxins and leaves you more susceptible to the cell damaging free radical oxidation or fermentation that leads to cancerous conditions and other diseases. And I have said many, for many years, in reality, there is only one sickness and there's only one disease, and there, that is the overacidification of the blood and tissues due to an inverted way of living, eating, and thinking. And if there's only one sickness and one disease, then there's possibly then only one health. And I believe that one health is, is maintaining the alkaline design of the internal fluids which then in turn maintains the health of your cells which, makes, which make up your organs and your tissues. So let me ask you this question. What kind of water do you drink now? Do you drink bottled water? Do you drink tap water? Do you drink filter ionizing water from a home system? Uh, like reverse osmosis water? Do you drink uh, filtered water from a third party? Uh, oh, I already had that down there, the reverse osmosis or the Brita water system. Uh, so what kind of water do you, do you drink? And what is the pH of the type of water that you're drinking? One of the chapters in one of my books called The pH Miracle, I have that chapter on water. I actually have tested hundreds of different waters and I find that most water, if not all water that I've taste, tested, has a pH of seven or less. Uh, our tap water, because they chlorinate it, uh, which is actually an alkalizing compound, but it's, it, it's also very difficult to get out of the body, uh, and it's not natural to the body, uh, has a pH just slightly over seven. Uh, so is the type of water you drink uh, does the pH, uh, is it 6 or 7 or 8 or greater than 9? So over the last 20 plus years, I have determined that there's four attributes of a healthy drinking water. The first attribute, which I'm sure you'd all agree with, 
that the water has to be clean and it has to be pure. It has to be free of heavy metals. It has to be free of toxic chemicals. It has to be free of pharmaceuticals. It has to be clean. It has to be free of ionizing radiation from nuclear fallout. This is, this is critical. The second attribute of a healthy water, I believe it has to be alkaline. Why? Because the human body is alkaline by design. All of its functions are acidic. Breathing, thinking, eating, all produce acids. Body, when it's born, it's alkaline by its design. We need to keep it that way if we want to keep it healthy and strong. The third attribute is the water has to be energized. It must carry an energy. Water is a catalyst that can deliver energy to the body. And of course, this energy can be measured using a meter, and it's measured in... Uh, had a senior moment here. <laughs> yeah, the water... <laughs> I started thinking about what I was talking about. Anyway, the water has to, be, has to be energized, and that water carries an electrical negative charge. And it can be measured in millivolts. Uh, it should carry a negative charge uh, versus a positive charge. So we measure the water. And also the water should be molecularly unclustered. Uh, traditionally, tap water is a clustered water, multiply clustered. We should have an unclustered water somewhere around three to five molecules. So these are the four attributes of healthy water. So the world's healthiest waters, uh, nature's answer, uh, Trinity is a, a water from uh, Idaho. It has a, uh, it's a well water. Uh, they have a well that goes down over two miles, and uh, the water that they extract there has a pH of approximately 9.5, so it has natural alkalizing salts of potassium and sodium bicarbonate. Lourdes uh, has had, uh, for centuries, been talked about, has healing powers. Uh, that, the pH of Lourdes is, is in the sevens. Uh, Hunza water is, is also in the sevens. Uh, Destiny water, which is a Hawaiian water uh, pulled from 3,000 feet below the ocean uh, surface. Uh, it's a clean, pure water, naturally alkaline at 7.5 water, uh, 7.5. And, and miracle water, of course, can have a pH anywhere, because it's an ionized water, can have a pH anywhere from a 1 pH clear up to a 12 pH or a 13 pH. So these water... Uh, particularly the alkaline waters have, uh, have shown to make a significant difference in people's health. And I've been studying this for, for many, many years. And as I increase the, the hydration of these alkaline fluids and we start hyper, uh, perfusing the tissues with uh, high pH waters ranging anywhere from a minimum of 9.5 up to 12.5, we see physiological changes that take place in the yeah, in the, the tissues in a positive way. Uh, so the characteristic of these waters that have, have, have been healing for, for many centuries uh, have a characteristic that they're all alkaline. And they have beneficial alkaline minerals such as sodium bicarbonate or potassium or magnesium. They also carry a strong electrically negative charge uh, that can be measured by using an ORP meter. Uh, they range anywhere from negative 50 millivolts clear up to a negative 750 millivolts. Uh, and, of course, if you're taking, let's say, just tap water and want to structure that water into an alkaline in, uh, in state, uh, these uh, uh, specific ionizing machines can help to do that by restructuring the water, increasing its electrical activity, and increasing its, its pH too as well, right from your tap. So how effective is, uh, is this type of water? Well, let me quote uh, Dr. Horowitz. International studies show that populations with little or no history of illness, such as cancer, drink higher pH alkaline waters. After all potential risk factors were considered and factored out, it became evident that they had been drinking waters with a pH of 9 to 10, close quote. 
So I've been talking about ionization, and many of you are probably thinking, well, what is ionization or what is an ion? An ion is a charged particle. That particle can be either negatively charged or positively charged. For example, hydrogen carries a positive charge, where uh, hydroxyl ions, which is OH, minus carries a negative charge. A water, water ionizer is a water technology that electrically activates or charges the minerals or ions in the water. This process alters the water in two ways. First, it raises or lowers the pH. Second, it alters the electrical properties by either increasing electrical activity in the forms of a saturation of electrons or it decreases electrical activity by increasing the saturation of protons in the water. It also, through this ionization process, the voltage will break up the natural microclustering. So the water, as it breaks down, uh, will be uh, smaller in its structure. So rather than, let's say, having 20 molecules uh, per cluster, you would have maybe three to five molecules per cluster. Well, what does that do when we break down these larger uh, clusters of water? One, it increases the surface area, and two, by increasing surface area, it increases surface charge. And this is how the pH then goes up, and also the electrical activity of the water goes up. Because as we break down these large clusters of water molecules into smaller and smaller clusters, even down to the monomolecular state, which would be one molecule, we're increasing surface area, which also increases surface charge of the water. So here's a pH scale ranging from a 3 pH to a 10.5 pH. Uh, and here you can see it's exponential. Uh, where we're going from a 7 to 8, that's 10 times more alkaline, or even up to a 10.5, which is 5,000 times more alkaline, versus, let's say, from a 7 to a 3 pH, which is 10,000 times more acidic. And what that means is, is the body becomes more acidic. It means it contains a higher concentration of positive charges or hydrogen ions. If the water is becoming more alkaline, then it contains more electrical negative charges or electrons in the water, so the water is, a saturate, uh, uh, is saturated with electrical energy in the form of electrons. As I've tested many different substances, uh, like orange juice, for example, uh, I have found that the pH of orange juice is highly acidic. Uh, here we have a, uh, a product, Sunny Delight, with a pH of 2.81 with an electrical charge which is saturated with hydrogen ions which is then expressed in a positive charge at 232, milli, uh, 232 millivolts. Uh, Bud Light uh, has a pH of 4.25 which is also acidic and also carries an electrical charge which is saturated with hydrogen ion, uh, ions giving an electrical uh, reading in millivolts of 177 millivolts. Uh, coffee at 5 with positive 140 millivolts. So when we look at some of the most common fluids that people are drinking, we find out that they're moderately or highly acidic and they carry a charge that would pull energy from the body rather than contribute energy to the body. Now this is an important thing to understand because as we're putting alkalinity in our body, this is actually contributing to our alkaline bank account or our alkaline reserves. When we're pulling energy or alkalinity away from our bodies, this is going to deplete our alkaline bank and, of course, create a symptom of enervation. And the biochemistry is very, very extreme. For example, uh, one of the metabolites uh, or acids from uh, metabolism is carbonic acid or H2CO3. Well, carbonic acid is highly acidic and it takes 20 parts of sodium bicarbonate, which is what the stomach produces, in order to neutralize this 
metabolite from metabolism, it takes 20 parts of sodium bicarbonate to neutralize one part of carbonic acid in order to maintain a normal pH of 7.365. So the body is constantly in need of alkalinity. The body is constantly starving for more electrons. It takes it from our food, it takes it from the water we drink, it can even take it from the sun. We absorb it through the skin. So many ways to get electrons uh, into our body, but this is what our body feeds on. You see, our bodies are electrical. They run on electricity, not on calories, not on sugar, not on proteins, not on carbohydrates, not on fats, but it runs on the electrical potential of what we're drinking, what we're eating, and what we're absorbing. Okay? So it's very, very important to understand that it's just about impossible to overalkalize because the ratios are quite extreme in the biochemistry of our bodies. This is a picture of, of blood from one of my clients that I, that I took many years ago who was on a highly acidic diet, incorporating lots of sugar and animal proteins. You'll notice that the blood is irregularly shaped. And of course, in the plasma, you see uh, uh, entities there that look like ping pong balls. These are what are referred to as Y-form yeast, a lot like uh, candida albicans. In the right side, you see the healthy organization, unhealthy organization of the way the blood coagulates. Uh, I'll show you here in a minute what healthy blood looks like when it coagulates, but it should not have any of these white areas at all. The actual clot should be tight, should be held together with a protein called fibrin, and there should be no spaces or missing uh, red blood cell conglomerate. Uh, here we see in the center, we see round, symmetrical, round protein pools, which indicates an, inflation, an irritation or an inflammation of the base of the body, which would be your, your reproductive organs or your bowels. Where here in an AIDS patient who had been on uh, AZT and other uh, chemical drugs for over 10 years, we see uh, a, a clot that is, is hypocoagulated, uh, coagulated, which is common in a degenerative condition where there's lots of red blood cell conglomerate missing. Here is the uh, healthy state of the red blood cells when you're on an alkalizing lifestyle and diet, particularly when you're hydrating with electron-rich alkaline water. The red blood cells are round and symmetrical, even in color, even in shape, even in size. The plasma is clear or clean. There's not a lot of cellular debris. And when we look at the way the blood coagulates, there's no missing red blood cell conglomerate where there's just white pasty masses. It's just one mat of red held together with a protein called fibrin, tightly held together in a hypercoagulated state. This is the state of those who are experiencing the highest level of energy, vitality, health, and fitness. This kind of blood you don't get. This kind of blood you have to work at. Just like when you work out to build muscle, you have to work out with intention to build healthy blood, you know, in order to build healthy bones and muscles. You do it with what you eat, and you do it especially with what you drink. You probably noticed down in the corner there's a fishbowl. And I hadn't referred to this as, as yet, but it's a metaphor that I've used for many, many years, and it starts out like this. When the fish is sick, what would you do? Would you treat the fish or change the water? And as you think about that question, the, amp the answer intuitively is very simple. Well, you would not treat the fish, but you would change the water. The next question is, what would your doctor do? Or how do we, how do we actually look at sickness and disease, and how do we respond to it? We respond to the treatment of the organs that are sick rather than realizing that the organ or gland or tissue that is sick or diseased is only as healthy as the water it swims in, much like the fish. The fish is only as healthy as the water uh, it swims in. So if overacidification is bad, then how does our body take care of this problem? Well, you have four channels of elimination to get rid of acid. You've got respiration, 
What would happen if you weren't able to get rid of carbon dioxide? Well, we know we used to do this as kids. We would hold our breath and see how long it took before we passed out. It only takes about three or four minutes. Then you lay there unconscious until the body can get rid of that particular or neutralize that particular acid and you wake up. Well, carbon dioxide is an acid that's produced during metabolism. It's a gas. You see, acids take on different forms, gas, liquid, or solid. Of course, we can't say, how do we get rid of all of our acid? Because we're constantly producing it through our thoughts and our words and our deeds. So the body has uh, a system. It's not a system that you can read about in the biology books, but it's a system called the alkaline buffering system. And the alkaline buffering system starts with the stomach. The stomach is the major organ that produces the alkalinity the body needs in order to neutralize the acids it produces through metabolism. That particular uh, alkaline compound is called sodium bicarbonate. So it begins with the stomach. As the stomach produ produces sodium bicarbonate, it delivers it by the circul circulatory system, the blood, to the various glands, so the salivary glands. What does the salivary gland release? It releases a compound called sodium bicarbonate. It, it also fills up the pyloris glands, the lubricant glands, uh, the pancreas as a gland secretes sodium bicarbonate to raise the alkalinity of the food that we eat and the liquids that we drink. Well, our body becomes overwhelmed with acid from lifestyle and dietary cho uh, choices. If we smoke uh, tobacco, if we chew tobacco, if we take pharmaceutical or recreational drugs, uh, if we're drinking acidic water, uh, if we're not exercising and removing acids through the pores of our skin, acids build up. So uh, what we eat, what we drink, and even our thoughts can create an overacidic uh, body overwhelming our body systems. And we go into what I call the alkaline buffering deficit. Now, where we're in an alkaline buffering deficit, what do we experience? We experience the seven stages of acidosis. We experience enervation, irritation, sensitivities, catarrh or mucus buildup, inflammation, induration, ulceration, and unfortunately, it's, we're seeing this more and more and more. We're seeing degeneration. This is the effect of a buffering deficit. Anyone who is sick or tired has been in a buffering deficit, an alkaline buffering deficit, for months and for years. So the buffering effect is uh, where the body starts responding to these acids. It starts neutralizing, uh, as I gave you an example earlier, uh, the body will actually take, uh, the stomach will produce the sodium bicarbonate, pull that into the blood to neutralize metabolic acids, and you end up with hydrochloric acid in the stomach, which is a waste product of sodium bicarbonate production. Do we need hydrochloric acid in the stomach? Absolutely not. You see, the stomach is not an organ of digestion. The stomach is an organ of contribution. Its main contribution is to manage the alkaline design of the human body. It's not to digest food. In fact, you only have one instrument to digest food, and that's your teeth. If you don't liquefy the food with your teeth in your mouth, then it goes into the stomach and out into the small and large intestine partially undigested. So it's very, very important. If you don't have the energy to chew, you know, then buy a blender, blend it. Buy a juicer, juice it. But get it into a state that the body can utilize the energy and life force of that particular food. When we're looking at the small intestine, and we realize that food has to be in a liquefied state, but on top of that, it has to be in an alkaline state. That liquid has a pH, ideally, of 8.4. So it's very, very important that we help support the alkaline design of the body and, the liquid, and keeping those fluids liquid by adding alkaline water. And so I, which is very, very strange for, for most health practitioners to actually recommend drinking alkaline water when you're eating. Because what we've been told is now in, op in opposition or actually the reverse of what we should have been told and need to understand. And that's it. that is that 
Here again, when we drink with our meals, we neutralize the acids of the stomach as the stomach is secreting alkalinity of the food to prepare it for biological transformation in the crypts of the small intestine. It is in the crypts of the small intestine, this liquefied food at a pH of 8.4, that you've helped to support by drinking alkaline water. You can then transform this food into embryonic cells that become the erythroblast in our new blood that travels through our circulatory system to become the new body cells. It all begins in the crypts of the small intestine. This is one of the reasons why I don't recommend eating foods that do not digest. They don't break down. Well, what foods would those be? Well, that would be beef, chicken, pork, and fish. They do not completely liquefy. So if you're going to eat any of these types of foods, you need to put them in a blender and juice them. You've got to get them into a liquefied state because if chicken goes into the small intestine partially undigested, it falls into the crypts of the small intestine, ferments, rots, and destroys the root system of your body. And then what happens then is you stop producing healthy blood. And when you stop producing healthy blood, you cannot produce healthy body cells. This is probably the most important critical point that I can mention and why I recommend drinking alkaline water. It is so critically important that we keep the fluids of our body alkaline from the mouth to the stomach and especially in the small intestine. Scientists now believe that acids or free radicals are causal factors in nearly every known disease. A free radical is an oxygen missing an electron. Actually, there's a lot of misunderstanding here. Uh, free radicals, very simply, are acids. They're ferments. And they're acids or, uh, caused by oxidation, fermentation. Oxidation or fermentation in our body is what weakens and destroys our tissues, particularly our connective tissues and our muscles even our bones. An antioxidant is in reality an antacid, something that reduces oxidation. Anything that reduces oxidation is an alkaline buffer. Anything that's going to alkalize or neutralize these acids is only going to help maintain the alkaline design of the body. Highly ionized water has more antioxidants or electrons than a fresh glass of squeezed orange juice. And that's also true with, uh, with any juice, for that matter. See, because when you, when you test anything that's, that's uh, let's say wheatgrass, for example, uh, wheatgrass will have a pH of between 6 to 6.5. So it is saturated in more hydrogen ions than what the body actually needs. So it actually has value there and it's chlorophyll and it's very beneficial in building the blood. And we're not drinking wheatgrass to alkalize the body, we're drinking wheatgrass to build blood. But it's very critical that we add alkaline water to whatever juices that we're, we're drinking to raise its alkalinity so it's saturated in electrons. There we help to maintain the fl alkaline fluids of the body. Well, orange juice has a pH of between 2.5 and 3, highly acidic, versus what we should be drinking, which is 9.5. If we look at this exponentially, we're talking about between orange juice to water, something that's 10 million times more acidic than this al alkaline water that I'm talking about. So orange juice, because of its high concentration of protons, its high concentrations of acids in the forms of sugars will actually paralyze the immune system for three to five hours. It will intoxicate it like alcohol and shut it down from its biological purposes to swim through the fluids of the body to maintain uh, purity and cleanliness. So the antioxidant potential of any fluids can be measured using a oxidative reduction uh, meter. That's what this is. It has a, a probe. And in this probe, 
we can then put this in water and we can turn it on and we can measure the pH of this water. Uh, and we can also measure the electrical potential of the water. Here we're seeing the electrical potential of this water is positive 76 millivolts and declining. So this water will actually pull energy from the body. The pH of the water is 5.4. Now, this is a pure, clean water, but it's not necessarily fit to drink. The kind of water that we want to be drinking is an alkaline water. Now, I can run this through an ionizer and create the 9.5 water with a negative 250 millivolts. But if I don't have that water ionizer and I'm traveling, then I'm going to have to do something else. I'm going to have to put into some alkaline minerals to shift the water pH. I'm just going to take one drop here, just one drop. That's it. One drop of potassium and sodium in the form of a hydroxide and a carbonate, and we're going to see a difference. The difference now, instead of a 5.5 pH, we've gone up to, it's still climbing, a 10.25. So from 5 to 6, that's 10 times. 6 to 7, that's 100 times. From 7 to 8, that's 1,000 times. From 8 to 9, that's 10,000 times. And from 9 to 10, did I do that one? That's 100,000 times. 10.65, and from 100,000 times to 11, right, that's a million, half of that, well, it's going up to 11. One drop, 10.74, with a charge of negative 232 millivolts. This water is now prepared to drink. It has been changed. It has been restructured. The pH has been changed from a 5.5 up to just about 11. The ORP, which stands for oxidative reduction potential. Anything that's oxidative is acid. Anything that's reduced is alkaline. We measure it in millivolts. It's negative 234 millivolts. We're talking about something that has been altered by using natural mineral salts and so powerful it only took one drop. You see, these things can be measured. So we take our pure water and we significantly restructure it. This is now restructured water. It is great to drink. That's the kind of water that will put energy back into the body. That's the kind of water that will bring up the reserves of your alkaline buffers if you're in an alkaline uh, buffer deficit. So the negative reading uh, refers to a reduction of fermentation or acids. And a positive reading uh, suggesting an increase of oxidation or fermentation or acid. Uh, Dr. Batman said this, you are not sick, you are thirsty. The brain is 80 to 85 percent water. The kidneys are 83 to 88 percent water. The muscles are 73 to 78 percent water. The blood is 90 to 93 percent water and the bones are 13 to 22 percent water. Now, I find this very, very interesting uh, because at birth, when we're born, uh, we are super hydrated. In fact, we're 90 percent water. And we look at the breakdown upon a brand new baby, 90 percent water, 8 percent fat, that's why they're so soft, soft and cuddly and so pliable because they're hydrated. And we're not talking about acid water. They, are, they, they smell sweet and they look sweet because they're totally alkaline. They're literally bathing their cells in a bath of alkalinity. It's when they start going on that acid food that things start changing. and They don't smell sweet anymore. But when you think about the proportions, 90% water, 8% fat, it kind of makes you wonder, how much of that baby is protein? 
1% protein. The rest of it is mineral. You say, when you look at the, it this way, you're going, what happened from you know, the most growth period of our time, uh, of our existence, from birth to our first year, to where things literally changed? We have now accepted as normal 70%. That's abnormal. 90% was normal. We digressed from the 90% to the 70%, except that is normal. At death, you're, you're, of course, under 70. You're probably closer to 60 to 50%. Dehydration is the number one cause of death. Because when you're not hydrated, you don't have the fluids to push out these acids that are constantly being produ produced. You don't have the conductivity with the sodium ions for energy to flow. You've got to be in the flow. To be in the flow, you have to be super hydrating. So it's very, very important that we're hydrating our bodies, but at the same time when we're hydrating, we're using the proper alkaline water. So I came up with this whole new then paradigm shift from the four food groups. Rather than them focusing on protein, carbohydrates, and fats, I shifted to uh, the, the, the four foundational food groups to maintain alkalinity of the fluids of the body and to build blood, which then builds body cells. The four food groups have now changed to what I call the COWS plan. The COWS plan is an acronym that stands for chlorophyll, oil, water, and salt. Chlorophyll to build the blood, oils to build the membranes of that blood, uh, water in an alkaline, electron-rich state, and then salt, which keeps it all together. Without the salt, it acts like the glue. Uh, it holds everything together. Salt is essential, particularly sodium is essential. It's why our blood is salted with sodium. It's why the ocean is salted with sodium. It's salted because it is the foundational element of which energy is transported. It is salt that keeps us alive, in combination with oxygen and water. So we put all that in as the foundation of our house of health to help manage this teeter-totter of life between uh, the pH balance, the biochemistry of the internal fluids of the body. So what percentage of water were you at birth? I think I already gave you the answer. 70%, 90%, 80%, 75%, or 60%? The answer is 90%. And here's another question to think about. How many liters of water per day do you estimate your body loses through urination, perspiration, defecation, and respiration? One liter? eight liters or three liters. The minimum amount of water that you lose on a daily basis is between three to four liters a day. Can you see how easy it is to become dehydrated? It is very, very easy. I mean, three to four liters, how much is that? It's close to a gallon a day of water. But it's the right kind of water. If you're drinking the wrong kind of water, it's hard to hydrate with that. It feels just like you know, a lot of water on the stomach and it kind of slushes back and forth. This doesn't happen when you're drinking alkaline water that's wetter. It permeates the tissues. It permeates the cells. So here are some of the negative effects of acidic dehydration. Mild chronic dehydration, you'll experience these symptomologies. A headache, low energy, low mental acuity, low back pain, digestive disorders, constipation, and of course, weight issues. Acute chronic dehydration, you'll start experiencing asthma, allergies, arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity. These are all symptoms of overacidity and dehydration. The effects of chronic dehydration is like running a car on too little or no oil. It will run but it won't well, run well, and eventually it will break down. Every cell has a specific function. It performs through metabolism. Water is the medium of that metabolism. 1% drop in cellular hydration equals a net 10% loss of metabolic efficiency. The cell's function is then impaired. When, dehyd when, when you're dehydrated, the body proprietizes the use of then water to the vital organs. The digestive order disorder 
uh, or acid reflux or gastroesophageal uh, redux disease is nothing other than an overacidic state due to the fact that the diet and lifestyle is over acid and the stomach is not producing enough sodium bicarbonate because it doesn't have the foundational materials. Salt has been taken out of the diet. You don't do that. You take out salt, the body needs that in order to produce alkaline buffers. What you need to take out of the diet is your acidic lifestyle and, and foods and drinks. When you put salt in the diet, you put the right kind of water, you add the right oils and lots of green foods, this I believe is the diet for the future, the diet for now. The diet that's critically, critically important because of all of the environmental pollutions, the toxic air, the toxic water, and now it's getting into our food sources. Uh, we need to protect ourselves with the right kinds of, of alkaline foods and waters. So how dehydration and acidosis works together? Uh, dehydration, the body uses that to help buffer acidity, and of course that acidity then is eliminated through urination, perspiration, uh, as these acids build up. Uh, and of course, I've given you earlier the seven stages of acidosis. Let me just review those very quickly. Uh, the first stage of acidosis is you start losing energy, enervation. The second stage is ir uh, sensitivities and irritation. Third stage is mucus buildup. Fourth stage is inflammation. Uh, fifth stage is induration. That's the hardening of the arteries, the hardening of the tissues, the connected tissues, the muscles. Cramping, this is induration. Uh, sclerotic plaque, uh, uh, cholesterol crystallization. This is all induration. The, the sixth level is ulceration, where acids are actually breaking down tissues, causing internal bleeding. And the last one is degeneration, which is the total breakdown of the tissue or the cell and the tissues. This is the last uh, final stage of acidosis. We can protect ourselves by drinking the right kind of water. I would suggest to you that uh, 70 to 80 percent of the world's population is dehydrated. All of us are su suffering some level of acidosis within our bodies, and we're experiencing that in a symptomology. I know that tap water is convenient, but it's not the best water that we should be drinking. Yes, it has a slightly alkaline pH because of some of the chemicals that are put in there, but it has not been properly filtrated and purified from heavy metals, from fluorides, from possibly lead, uh, from uh, chlorine, uh, and, and also from uh, pharmaceuticals that are now showing up in our waters. So the quality of our tap water is not necessarily, even if we drink it, is going to contribute to better health. As we look at uh, tap water, we see it that typically it's in a 20 to 24 uh, molecule cluster. This water is very heavy. It does not absorb into the tissues and it kind of slushes back and forth in our stomach and intestines. Through a process of ionization, which is an electrical process, using voltage or power to break these molecules apart, we break them apart in smaller molecular clusters, even down to the monomolecular state. Now, how would we know this? Well, using special, special meters, as we increase, as we see an increase in the oxidative reduction potential up over negative 450 millivolts, we now know that we're in a monomolecular state. The microclustering effect and the negative charge is what makes alkalized ionized water different. In fact, up to six times more hydrating than other waters that you're going to get from a bottle or from a tap. Here's a more scientific look at uh, molecular clustering. We actually see the molecules of water stuck together in, in a cluster and of course through a process of electricity breaking that cluster out and then through a plate system attracting the, the particles or the minerals, the ions, from one side to the other, the positive minerals to one side, the negative charged minerals to another side. So we see things like sodium and chloride and potassium 
and bicarbonates and calcium magnesium being taken to one side, which is the alkaline side, uh, and we, <coughs> we see the, uh, uh, some of the other elements uh, being taken off to the other side. So when we have acid minerals within the water, they are separated uh, through a, a plate system as the water flows over it uh, through uh, polarity of those particular elements they're attracted, the positive are attracted to the negative side and the positive uh, ions are collected and attracted to, to, to the positive side. And of course, you get then two flows of water. As the water flows over this plate, you get an acid water and you get an a alkaline water. So you have two different sources of water and both are valuable. I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute, how you can use not only the alkaline water uh, for hydration of our bodies, but how we can use the acid water too uh, uh, for, for many purposes as well. So here's your turn now. Do you currently uh, buy your water for any reason? Only when I'm out at events, work, traveling, or restaurants? Yes, for all home use and even when I'm out. Never ever. I don't drink unknown sources of water. Occasionally, only when I absolutely have to. Or are you kidding? Why would I pay when I can drink tap water for free. Well, let's look at some of the costs. What do you estimate your personal cost of water consumption is per year? Well, one bottle of water per day at a minimum of one dollar per purchase would be three hundred and sixty dollars a year. Uh, two five gallon water drugs per week at approximately eight dollars per jag is seven hundred dollars and fifty seven hundred and fifty dollars. A combination of A and B would be over $1,000, and under $100, was, I invested in a pH water filtration system and now only pay for the filters annually. Or the last one would be nil. I drink the, the free stuff that comes from uh, the, the uh, water tap. Well, in water that uh, we're from the tap, we're getting chlorination, we're getting fluoride, we're getting radiation, we're getting pharmaceuticals and other contaminants. If contaminants are bad, wouldn't pure water be good then? Pure water uh, that we're buying from the stores is man-made. Uh, the healthy natural minerals many times are, are removed, such as in distilled water. Uh, many of these waters, I've tested them, are highly acidic. They have a large cluster size, so they carry a positive charge, thereby pulling energy from the body, and they're hard to absorb because they're all clustered together. They're not a wetter water. The seven and nine stage miracle ionizers that are manufactured and developed uh, through Chanson uh, leaves your water 99.9% .9 contaminant free. And depending on your setting, in a very small clustering of these water molecules, three to five, or in a higher setting uh, in a monomolecular state, giving you clean, healthy, electrically charged, electron-rich ionized water. Alkaline ionizers have been in Asia for over 30 years. Asian cultures tend to be more holistic and proactive in their approach to health. Uh, in Japan, one out of five persons are drinking alkaline water. In Korea, it's one in eight. And in the United States, it's approximately one in 15,000. If we look at the World Health Organiza Organization, or WHO, and their rankings on per capita spending, Japan is number nine, U.S. is number one. In longevity, Japan is number one in longevity. The U.S., of all the industrial countries, is 24. And our health systems, Japan is ranked number 10, and the U.S. is ranked number 37. When we look at alkaline water in, its, its, in a crystalline state, we see it in a perfect, perfect crystal. This work was done by Dr. Emoto. So when we're looking at structured functional water, we're creating two waters through ionization using the chance and water machine. Uh, we're creating a functional 
structured alkaline water, uh, and we're creating a structured uh, uh, functional uh, acid water too. And uh, measuring the vibrational frequency, so we've talked about the millivolts, which is electrical potential. Uh, we're talking about its vibration. Vibrations uh, are measured in hertz. Uh, one vibration is one hertz. Uh, traditional uh, tap water that's coming out of our, our faucets are running about 127 hertz, uh, which would uh, equate to a water that's uh, 20 to 24 molecules clustered together. Uh, so it is a, uh, it's not a wetter water. And then if we're measuring the vibrational frequency of the uh, miracle waters. Uh, we're looking at a vibrational frequency of approximately 47 hertz, which would put it down into the four to six uh, molecule clustering. So this, this water would constitute then something that would be more permeable to the cell, cell membrane, uh, thus a wetter water. So when we're using either of these waters, whether they're our, our alkaline water or our acidic water, there are functions. Uh, we've talked about some of the functions of, of reversing some serious health challenges by just changing the water, much like with the metaphor, if the fish is sick, you don't treat the fish, you change the water. So in this case, we're going to be using the alkaline structure, structured functional water at a pH of at least 9.5 at negative 250 millivolts at 47 hertz, which constitutes a wetter water, we're going to be drinking that. We drink that on a daily basis. Even the water that we use for cooking purposes in our preparations, we should also use this alkaline water. On the other side of the equation where we're getting a structured functional water at a pH of as low as a pH of uh, 2 to 3, uh, we still have uh, microcluster clustering of about 4 to 6 at a, meg, uh, at a uh, hertz at 47. Uh, but here now we've got a wetter water, but it's an acid water and doesn't burn. It's not like traditional acid. Uh, acids generally are thought of something that would burn the skin. This, this type of water will not burn the skin, but it's functional in the sense that when it comes in contact with, let's say, bacteria or yeast, it causes it to transform. It causes it to break down. So the acid water becomes a bacterial side, a fungal side, but there's no chemicals used. And it's been shown to eradicate, you know, strep and staph and E. coli. And in traditional medical terms, instantly, or to cause it, its DNA to unravel or to, ge to degenerate. In other words, it's not a conducive environment for uh, the bacteria or yeast to be in, so it, it breaks down. This same effect does not happen if you're, let's say, using this acid structural functional water on your skin. Uh, because of its positive charge, and let's say we're working with a, a, uh, uh, a client who has poor circulation to the extremities, whether they be your hands or your feet, if you use the structural functional acid water at a pH of 3, uh, you can soak for a half hour. That will cause the body to flow to its opposite attraction. Water being positive charged, blood being negative charged, and opposites attract. Blood will follow its, its electrical opposite. So it'll be attracted to the water, causing blood to flow to the extremities. It's a great way to naturally improve circulation. Uh, you can take small amounts of the acid water internally to help break un down undigested matters. So if you're using the, the acid pH functional structured water, it will actually break down undigested animal proteins or mucus and clear that out of the body. So you can use that uh, not only as a, a, uh, a laxative, but you can also use it as a diuretic to help break down acid crystallization in the digestive or the alkaline buffering system as well as the circulatory system and the lymphatic system too as well. You would just take small amounts. You wouldn't be drinking one liter of acid water. You'd be drinking one liter of alkaline water, but prior to doing that you would be taking like three or four ounces of the acid water to help in your eliminations and to improve circulation. So you can use this 
as uh, uh, both internally as well as externally, but it's primarily the acid water is used externally. Uh, uh, the medium low pH uh, use of the structured alkaline functional water is able to tighten or smooth your skin. So here you're looking at, some, uh, at a pH of around five. It's effective in the treatment and prevention of acne or pimples uh, or rashes to actually clean the skin of acid residues that are coming out through the pores of the skin. You see, the body will push acid out through the channels of elimination. Well, the largest channel of elimination is the skin. You have 3,500 pores per square inch. Out of these pores, the body removes its own bodily metabolic waste products. These acids coming from metabolism and diet can actually cause then the blemishes that we refer to as rashes or pimples or acne. If we use the acid water, we can clean the skin of acid residues and protect the skin as we are alkalizing the internal fluids of the body and helping to build blood that will restore the health to the skin. We can also use it as ability to disinfect and sterilize and help in treatment of minor skin wounds as well. The medium high pH use, which would be in the eight to nine range, uh, we can use it to provide more uh, hydroxyl ions or oxygenation to the tissues. It neutralizes acids, uh, also referred to as free radicals. It increases the energy level of your body because you're contributing electrical potential for the mere fact that the water is an alkaline ionized state that is saturated with electrical energy or electrons. Uh, correcting your body's acid and alkaline balance so that if you have acidic areas of the body, whether they be the stomach or the small intestine, or if it be in other areas of the body, such as in the, in the muscle tissue, you can drink this water. And uh, because it is wetter, it'll, it'll help permeate uh, uh, the tissues uh, to neutralize the acids that are causing irritation and inflammation. Uh, because of its, uh, uh, its monomolecular state or its uh, in a, in a small clustering, uh, it will also permeate the cell membranes, thus hydrating the cells. And we see this a lot in red blood cell evaluations where we see dehydrated or compressed red blood cells. And when you start drinking the alkaline water, the red blood cells become plump, become more flexible, they become stronger. Uh, the alkaline, medium alkaline water helps to reduce many symptoms of aging that come from dehydration and acidic lifestyles and diets and also acts as a surfactant and a detergent. So you can use the alkaline water to clean your clothes or if you have, let's say, some sort of a delicate uh, uh, silk that you want to clean, you can use the alkaline water, soak it in, it will, it will clean and, and uh, those uh, delicates that uh, you don't want to put in the washer or you don't want to chemically uh, treat it like the, uh, such as in dry cleaning. In summary, ionized water from a efficient, you know, well thought out ionization machine manufactured by Chanson uh, that incorporates all the principles of, of alkalizing and, and energizing the body and at the same time on the other side using that acid proton rich uh, water to help clean the skin or improve circulation. When these, these uh, technologies are well thought out and used properly with the understanding that the human body is alkaline by design, although it's acidic by function, we can use these waters uh, with, uh, with the proper direction that will then help in the reversal of some very uh, challenging conditions or symptomologies. We can practice prevention rather than treating disease. We can prevent many of the conditions that we're seeing uh, uh, today.